Hier geht es jetzt weiter mit ähm, unserer äh, Podiumsdiskussion zum Thema Reclaim Smart City. Ähm, viele von euch waren wahrscheinlich jetzt schon auf den anderen Bühnen unterwegs und haben ähm, von dem Smart Home über äh, die Sma das smarte Land und die Landwirtschaft äh, und äh, Stadtkonzepte sich in Workshops und auf der Bash-Bühne vorinformiert und wir versuchen das jetzt hier vielleicht so ein bisschen als Fokus zusammenzubinden. Und äh, ich äh, begrüße dann unseren Moderator Leon Kaiser, für, der schreibt für Netzpolitik und seine Gäste Eva blum Dumonté, Stefan Kaufmann und Sibylle Bauriedl. Ja, vielen Dank. Ich werde vielleicht noch kurz was zum Format sagen. Wir haben uns das so gedacht, dass wir aus drei Perspektiven dieses Thema beleuchten, jeweils 15-minütige Kurzvorträge haben und am Ende dann eine gute halbe Stunde diskutieren können und auch öffnen werden für euch alle, dass ihr dann Fragen stellen könnt und mit uns diskutieren werden. Anfangen wir Sibylle Bauriedl. Sie ist Professorin für integrative Geografie in Flensburg und hat gerade ein, ein interessantes Buch mit herausgegeben, die smarte Stadt im Transkript Verlag. Das findet ihr auch im Forum, was einen interdisziplinären Ansatz hat und auch aktivistische Stimmen zu Wort kommen lässt. Sie wird beginnen und etwas Konzeptionelles zum Smart City Konzept sagen. Danach kommt Eva Blum de Monté von Privacy International aus London, die sich auch schon länger mit dem Thema beschäftigt und dort eine Studie geschrieben hat, die sie uns auch gleich äh, vielleicht kurz vorstellen wird und ein bisschen die globale Perspektive, ähm, globale Beispiele äh, mitbringen wird aus London und aus Indien und damit auch zeigt, äh, dass das Thema wirklich äh, ja, international ist und auch äh, Städte international in, ein, in eine Art Wettkampf äh, führen kann. Ähm, als dritten Redner haben wir Stefan Kaufmann vom äh, Projekt Verschwörhaus der Stadt Ulm. Dort, äh, das ist sozusagen ein, ein Ort, an dem äh, Zivilgesellschaft und Menschen in der Stadt zusammenkommen können ähm, und zusammen Projekte anstößen können ähm, und steht im Widerspruch zu vielen Projekten, ähm, wo eben hauptsächlich Wissenschaftler, äh, Stadtpolitiker und Industrie zusammenarbeiten, wie wir sie äh, oft kennen. Ähm, ich freue mich, dass wir die drei gewinnen konnten, die sich schon länger mit diesem Thema auseinandersetzen. Right, let's continue. I'm very happy to give the floor to Silke, the host of the next meeting. Kannst du eventuell die Türe noch zumachen oder rummachen, gelegentlich, wann auch immer ist deine Zeit. Also anlehnen ist, glaube ich, okay. Ja? Ja. Wie, also wie du magst, wie du magst. Ich habe äh, die Aufgabe bekommen, so Perspektiven auf Digitalisierung in Städten und äh, auf die Auseinandersetzung. Good afternoon. I'm very happy to welcome you. I'm Sibylle Bauriedel and I will be your host for a session entitled Reclaim Smart City Bits and Bäume. That's the title of the conference and it's always interesting to look at what people have in mind when talking. Now I'm rather the Bäume side, the tree side. I've been dealing with the urban environment, with climate and I've not only focused on metropolises, but also on small and mid-sized cities. I focus on German and international urban development, and I focused in particular on what happens in East Africa. Sustainability studies and development studies are, so to speak, the background of my arguments. For a year and in the preparation of an anthology dealing with the critical dimension 
of the digitization of the city. I've read quite a number of texts. 35 authors were involved in this anthology and I've benefited from their knowledge quite a bit. I've been an urban planner, but I've also been involved in the right to the city movement in Hamburg. In my presentation, I will focus on the academic side and in the debate we'll have afterwards, I would like to offer a number of examples taken from the emancipatory context of the city of Hamburg. Reclaim the city, that's the title of this session. And I'm first and foremost interested in the question of technologies of our times and digitization and digital infrastructures and how these are used in order to make the future. This is about the smart city and this is about generating ideas of the city as such. And of course, we need to look at the players involved, the different sides, the agents, if you wish in order to get a better idea of the future. Now, we are dealing with the urban situation of our times, which is characterized by the spatial dimension of the digital tools we are using in our everyday lives. We've talked about the, mo the means which are being used, but also about the global players, i.e. about the IT industry, that's the software and hardware providers and manufacturers who are shaping the urban environment of the day. We've talked about the smart city for quite a while now, but not long ago. It used to be a new feature. Digitization, you f find digital means dating from the 1970s already, the waste management, the water management of the city and so on, uh, or have involved digitization for quite a while. But then there is also the telematics side I mean, that's what it was called at the time. And I would like to remind you of the particular idea of the city as we know it from the 1980s. Now, this is a picture taken from a book published in the 1980s when people didn't talk about the virtual city as much as they do today. It's a book published by the Academy for spatial studies and landscape design and planning and the vision the planners and the architects had at the at the time was and is very different from what people are thinking today because they saw that tele entertainment teleworking and other features or gadgets of the 1980s would trigger a de centralization, a deconcentration of the city, so to speak, an isolation of the city center, i.e. you would be dealing eventually with empty city centers because people would stay at home, stay in suburbia where they would have their computers and work. A depopulation actually is what they thought that would happen. Now, this is very different from what people are seeing today. At the time, public enterprises were particularly important. They were the ones who established the infrastructures needed, the Deutsche Post, for example, when it was still a public enterprise, the German Postal Service and other corporations today. The situation is a bit different and we can see what has changed in the last 30 years. And we know today that the development did not lead to less density, but to much more density downtown because of the optimization of traffic flows, because of the digital infrastructure, which was increasingly being used in 
the cities. And then the smart city is offer oriented. In other words, big and small cities have become the ex the field of experimentation of companies involved in the development of digital infrastructures. This is also a new feature, and I would like to look at what has developed since then, because that's also the point of departure for us who are talking about the future of the city. And the visualization you see on this chart is what you've often seen, I'm sure. It means to tell us that we have and will have cities which are extremely dense with lots of high rise buildings and e mobility as the preferred means of transport. What has changed? We have had a technological transformation and we are experiencing this transformation, all of us, and we are very happy about little smart um, USB medium media storage capacity has increased considerably and we are happy to put as much information on a USB stick as never before. All the gadgets, all the devices we are using have become smaller and we are happy to have these tiny tools in our pockets. But there's also been a governance transformation in the last few years. Cities understand what a city is very in a very different way from what they considered a city in the 1980s. And metropolises in Germany are now relating with metropolises all over the world when it comes to the question who or which city is the smartest. We're also dealing with a societal transformation. We have few big corporations who are implementing proprietary software systems and others, that's Microsoft, that's SAP, but it's also Amazon and other companies, a few companies, but these companies have found new fields to generate profits. And many cities, especially big cities in Germany, be it Hamburg, Berlin have to agree to those private partnerships, private public partnerships, in order to organize public services and a management of the letter. The situation, however, has also changed in terms of the communication we are having today in the last 10 years because our com communication is first and foremost an internet-based communication. The question is what kind of potentials are being opened up due to this systemic transformation because we are all invited to use the digital infrastructures in order to move in the cities. There are certain urban spaces which have become smart cities. That's, uh, first of all, the um, inner cities. Now, when talking about the smart home, we are never talking about public, public housing. We are talking about private housing projects and of course we are also dealing with different generations and different incomes here and 
we witness a systemic transformation also with respect to the digitization of all fields of action and intervention in the city. And I would like to show you another chart here, because this is not only about digital data transfer. This is also about a dramatic extension of the digital infrastructure. You find sensors all over the city in order to guarantee parking place management and other types of management which are key in the city. Also, in public spaces, in green spaces, in parks, you have more and more of a monitoring system. Now, there are certain key tasks to be handled by the municipality. That's the environment, that's traffic and transport, security, energy, housing, consumption, waste management, social exchange, education, and knowledge are the buzzwords here. Public services in cities are offered by the local authorities and are very much characterized by processes of digitization. Now, the services and the infrastructure in cities are increasingly offered by private corporations, and they go along with a major promise of modernization, optimization, efficiency gains, accessibility, and a better organization and structuring of the city is what IT offers. That's the claim i.e. the answer to all problems a city needs to solve. And let me remind you what this looks like in everyday life. One example would be the waste management digitization is increasingly important. Sensors are being used or leisure time activities, infrastructures, what to find where in public space technologies which will matter in the future. That's another example taken from Hamburg. The city I know best. In three years, there will be the World Congress of Transport in Hamburg. The city has uh, been a candidate to hosting this uh, Congress, and they are the winners, and they are now going to present this process and, of course, this conference. And, of course, they want to showcase their only their own digitization solutions like um, the organization of parking spaces in the city, which is a purely digital one in Hamburg, which again, by the way, shows that the city is focusing on private transport. The smart city means in Hamburg and elsewhere to take more cars, to get more cars into the cities and to well to, to organize traffic flows well. It's a very traditional idea of the city of the future. And the same goes for automatic driving, public transport that is. Berlin is also running a number of experiments in this field of um, automatic public transport. For services, this is also an interesting field. Car sharing, for example, also means that people who used to uh, walk or go by bike are driving cars now. So digitization and sustainability are not always going hand in hand. What would be the critical perspectives in this respect? Cities, the smart city in particular, is a new field of business for enterprises. The smart city is the label of a competition-focused urban policy, and we are also seeing a new idea of the informational right of the city, i.e. the use of digital information generated in the city might trigger participatory democratization processes, which might be more important in the future, and this is certainly an aspect we should come back to in our debate. So enterprises introducing digital technologies, meaning 
They want to make money by offering the digital approach, the smart city as a label and as a means to be or to become or to remain competitive and the information and how to deal with data privacy and information in cities. All this also implies the idea of harmonization or the unifor uniformization of the city because ultimately cities which are organized this way more or less all look the same, be it in the United States or in Europe. Now these are the key questions I would like to raise under the headline of the city which is to be reclaimed. We say reclaim the city, meaning not meaning, sorry, um, how much digitization can I offer to a smart city or how smart does a city have to be, but how much urbanity potential does a smart city offer? which implies the question of who controls the technologies used, who makes sure that there is participation and democracy, and what about sustainability and social justice, which is part of the global question of justice and the social and ecological costs, which are the consequence of the digitization of the city. I would like to suggest that when we talk about smart cities, we need to consider the political dimension. We want to use digital technologies in an emancipatory way. Thus, we also need to ask what future city is the adequate one to make this possible. And the future of the city is certainly a contested field. It's not about the smart city. It's about urbanity and the potential of a city and the emotional right to a city. It's not about data sovereignty. It's about that. It's about the knowledge about for what purpose and how the data gained are being used. Open source and open code are movements which want to open up digital spaces. In, over, in order to overcome the exclusionary trends triggered by proprietary systems. But we need to see digital technologies in the context of the city and in the context of the urban diversity, which is first and foremost about the fundamental structures of the future city and the sustainable use of digital technologies. This is not about forgetting what technologies we have had already, and this is not about throwing away our smartphones. This is about generating ideas in a participatory approach and how to use them in the future. And this is all from my side. I would like to give the floor to the next two speakers. So, whilst uh, the next speaker is coming up, I would like to mention something that Leon also mentioned is in his introduction. I'm referring to a discussion which we conducted as part of that book. It's also available here. Let me just show it briefly. These are the topics. Uh, well, more than 30 authors were involved, and they put these uh, topics up for discussion. They discussed, for instance, what does um, an urban policy uh, that is geared towards corporations uh, mean? Uh, I mean, it uh, has something to do with smart cities. And, uh, you know, by way of example, they discuss various examples of emancipatory cities. Thank you. Hello. Um, apologies in advance because I'll be speaking in English, but hopefully I'll try and speak slowly enough. Okay. Mm. 
Great. So uh, my name is Eva Bloom de Monte. I work for a charity in London called Privacy International. Uh, and as the name would suggest, we uh, fight for the right to privacy. And we, well, fight for the right to privacy and fight against uh, surveillance across the world. So we work with a, a network of partner organizations in different countries. Uh, so we try and really bring uh, a global perspective to uh, our research and our advocacy around privacy and surveillance. Now, what we mean by surveillance is um, the question of uh, not just government surveillance, but also corporate surveillance and social surveillance. Uh, and actually what I find particularly interesting with, uh, with smart cities is uh, the interaction between, uh, between the public sphere the corporate, and the corporate sphere, the private sphere, uh, that work together to create uh, a different experience of the public space. So for the past couple of years, I've been uh, working on smart cities. Um, and uh, we, I produced a, a report last year um, on how IBM had uh, worked on shaping uh, what we define as a, as a smart cities and, uh, and how we think about smart cities. And as I was, uh, before I published the report and, uh, and after the, the launch of the report, I was often giving, uh, giving talks on the, on the topic of smart cities like I'm doing now. And um, as I was traveling through Europe, uh, I was always asking people, sorry, uh, do you live in a smart city? And you know, you would think that people who were, um, who were present in the room uh, would sort of know uh, what a smart city was, right? Um, if they were attending talks on smart cities. And yet, one thing that was interesting to me is that most of the time, people were not raising their hands when they were asked if they lived in a smart city. And it might just be that they weren't actually listening to me, uh, but I, um, I started asking myself why is it that in those cities where I was giving talks, often the city was allocating quite a lot of funding to smart city development, and yet uh, people didn't feel like they lived in a smart city. And I think there were mostly um, two reasons for that. Uh, one of them is there isn't really a clear definition uh, of what a smart city is. And, uh, and the bottom line really is that um, whoever the, the smart city is for, well, it, it's not smart for them. Uh, and so I want to go back a little bit around this, uh, this idea of the, the definition of what a smart city is and, and try and deconstruct a little bit what we understand by, by smart city. Because um, one of the issues of, um, sorry. Uh, one of the issues with, um, with the term is, uh, is that it is sold to us as this idea that uh, technology and the collection of our data in the public space is going to transform our experience of the city. It's going to make our city more efficient. It's going to make our city more sustainable. Uh, and yet, you know, w what is it? What are they actually selling to us? It's not, it's not always clear. And the fact is, I think, one definition that I like to, to push for is just a simple, uh, this simple idea, and this very basic idea, that essentially smart city is uh, the use of technology and data collection in the public space, uh, in a city more specifically. Uh, and so that comes down to this much more sort of basic, uh, basic understanding of what a, of what a city is. And, and then when you have this in mind, you can sort of ask uh, maybe more, uh, you can demand more accountability and ask for more explanation from your city. And what I mean by that is that if you look at a city like London, here is the problem that we have. Uh, there is, you know, the London Smart City Program, and that's run by the, the Smart London Board, and there is, I don't have the exact figure, but essentially several millions of pounds that are allocated to making London a smart city. Uh, and that's all fine, whatever that means, that's, uh, you know, clear, there is allegedly some public consultations around this, there's at least sort of a, a front, uh, a, fr a front that, uh, to this program. 
Now, the problem is that they're not really the only ones. Whatever they're doing, they're not actually the only ones really transforming our experience of the public space. They're not the only one uh, working on this use of technologies that are affecting our experience of the public space. Uh, we have, for example, we have Transform for London, which is uh, the, the body that's uh, in charge of the public transport. Uh, so already, when you're in London, the way you would use the public transport is that you know you have a you have a car that you tap in and out from. Uh, so they know at all points like where you're going, uh, where you're going from, and where you're going to. Often that's already problematic because people don't realize that uh, their card are tied to their identity because the way you, you charge one of those cards is by often by using, in, well, I won't say 99% of the case, you would use your uh, debit or credit card. Uh, and once you start using your debit and credit card to charge your Oyster card, which is the, the public transport card, then the card is tied to your name. So there's already quite a lot of surveillance um, on uh, in the public transport, but as you'll see, because I'll be talking a lot more about them, uh, there's a lot more that's going on as well. Uh, and you have uh, you have the police, uh, the Met Police, that also have their own uh, digital strategy, um, therefore their own uh, their own program that's changing changing the city, changing what the city uh, city looks like for people. Uh, and also, uh, at a various borough and council level, uh, we see a lot of smart cities development. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit more. So, as I said, all, all of those groups are, are transforming our experience of the public space. Now, the problem is, um, who do you ask accountability to? Uh, and because all of those, all of those bodies that I've just presented, uh, to an extent, engage in what I would refer to as, as a smart city, in the use of technology, in the fact that they're collecting data about us. Uh, if we take the um, one of the two main problems, I would argue, uh, of smart cities would be the question of surveillance and the question of exclusion. Uh, certainly on the surveillance side of, uh, of this, definitely all of those entities are surveilling us, are making all cities a space where we're no longer anonymous, where we no, can no longer exist as, a, as an anonymous entity in the streets. So. This is uh, an, another example from, um, from London. Uh, so this is, a, in case you can't really figure that out, this is a, a, a recycling bin. And the recycling bin was showing some advertisement on it. And, you know, it looks all fine. As you walk by this bin, you have an ad uh, broadcasted. Now, what people didn't realize is that the ad they were seeing, the advertisement they were seeing on the bin, was actually targeted for them specifically. And the way it was working is that essentially as you would pass by the bin, the bin would um, gather the data from your phone. And based on this data, you know, they would say, uh, they would use the IMEI number of your phone to figure out if you were someone who walked by this bin pretty often, what walked by in the area, or if you were new to the area, maybe what shop you were going from and to after. And so based on this, you would get that targeted advertisement for you. Uh, now, people were not aware of this, and people didn't realize this. And when it came out, uh, what people realized what was going on because uh, some journalists exposed the story, uh, it caused some outrage and uh, the beans had to be removed. And what was interesting was the reaction of the CEO of the company that had installed those bins and who said he didn't understand why it had caused such outrage because London's already the most surveilled city in the world. Um, so a little more from uh, the um, TFL, the Transport for London, the pub, uh, public transport entity that I was mentioning before. Um, they launched a, quite a large program last year on uh, using the Wi-Fi to track people 
uh, in, the, in the public transport. And the idea was that it wasn't enough to know how crowded the tube were, but what I wanted to find out was uh, how people walked within the station, where exactly, if they used the stairs, if they used lift, if they used elevators, uh, where exactly they were walking within, uh, within the, the station. And the idea was that, you know, it would help, um, it would help solving the issues of uh, overcrowding. And, you know, it was, uh, it was a little odd, this idea that, like, you know, you need to track people's Wi-Fi to, to find out exactly where they're going, as if, you know, any, any person who goes into the tube can't figure out themselves when the peak hours are and when the tube is crowded or not. But anyhow, that was, uh, that was the narrative that uh, they were giving to us. So, again, this narrative that, like, using technology, you'll get a better service uh, from the use of technology. Now, fast forward a few months, uh, and actually it turns out they were uh, hoping to make um, quite a substantial uh, profit from collecting the, the data. And I, arguably what they said is that um, they weren't selling your data, and it wasn't personal data. And that was the same thing, for example, with uh, the recycling bins that I was telling you about. And th that's actually quite an important narrative in the smart city, is that it's not personal data. And fair enough, it's not personal data that we're selling, uh, yet they create an environment in which you're constantly tracked at all time within the tube, and based on this, they are using this information to be able to sell to companies the knowledge that they've gathered from you. And this knowledge is like, well, we know in this, uh, in this part of the tube, at this time of the day, people are more likely to take the elevators or people are more likely to take the escalators. And then, uh, and then you should be showing them, uh, you should be showing them advertisement because they have more time or whatever. Uh, and actually yesterday, um, we learned that uh, they were now exploring a new, a new way of, uh, of doing this work, uh, not by using the Wi-Fi, but by automatically signing up all the um, O2 customers in London uh, into a tracking program. Again, selling us this narrative that um, it's to try and save the problem of rush hour. Um, so hopefully, um, uh, I mean, we should be maybe taking their word for it, that now that they're going to be able to track every O2 customers, they'll be able to, to, set, to solve the problem of our shower. Uh, but obviously, we haven't really necessarily been convinced by uh, this narrative in the past. Uh, this is, uh, to get a little bit away from London, this is, I think, one of the, one of the large programs that uh, was happening when I was uh, doing the research on uh, on, on smart cities when I was publishing my report. Uh, this was in Toronto where uh, Google partners with the city of Toronto to, uh, to create this entire uh, smart city. And so that, that's kind of the fantasy of side, Sidewalk Lab, which is uh, the, this Google company. Uh, their idea is to create really a smart city from scratch. Uh, was a um, centralized identity management system where uh, you would use the same card for, um, uh, for your library card, your health card, uh, where everything, all this information is, uh, is centralized. Uh, now, just last month, actually, the, the person who was uh, the privacy consultant that I had hired uh, resigned because she said she was hoping to create uh, a smart city of privacy, but it turns out that um, at the moment the project is turning into a smart city of surveillance, which isn't entirely surprising for a, a Google-run project, but anyhow. Uh, and the, the last example I wanted to, to mention was the, the Smart City Mission in India, where uh, it was a project that was launched in 2015, and the plan was to build uh, 100 smart cities across the, the world. And so for that, uh, the, there was a, a government body that suggested creating a, a liveability index to clearly define, well, what are the, what are the criterions that the city needs to match uh, to be considered smart, uh, which 
you know, we, you would think was a, a pretty good idea. But the reaction from the, the governments uh, was to refuse the creation of, um, of the index and arguing that, um, you know, we, we should, essentially we shouldn't have a definition of smart cities because they understood that the risk of having this index, of having a clear standard, uh, was that, well, probably none of the 100 city would actually effectively uh, match this, uh, the standards. Uh, and, you know, we know in 2018, uh, so, you know, four years have passed, and yet uh, there is, uh, there's yet to have sort of substantial development uh, on the Smart Cities project. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the lands have been forcibly taken from, uh, from people, often the poorest people living in the, in the cities. And, um, and also the, the project of the beautification and the, the cleaning of the cities uh, have already had impact on the more vulnerable portion of the population. So for example, um, you know, there used to be street vendors in the streets, and street vendors are really important for women uh, because they actually take part in making the, the city safer for women. And uh, as many of you, may, well, many women will know, um, deserted streets are usually the ones where we're most likely exposed to, to risk of harassment. So having people in the streets that were constantly there uh, was actually a form of, uh, of protection that has now been removed by, uh, by this efforts to create smart city. Uh, so just to conclude, um, I think smart cities insofar as we're talking about the use of technologies, they're there to stay. And it's not to say that, you know, we shouldn't have smart cities because that's absurd. Uh, we're not, you know, we're not suggesting going back to the middle of ages. Uh, but what we want is ensuring uh, that the cities are smart for the people who live in them. Uh, so it's ensuring that uh, there is accountability, uh, that the technology that's being used is, um, is actually being used for the people. Uh, and maybe we need to create a new narrative where uh, the city is not just about the data that's being, uh, that's being collected and uh, thinking, rethinking new ways, and this is uh, the topic that we are hopefully discussing here, reclaiming the city, reclaiming new ways of, uh, of thinking about the city that's not just about the, the data that's collected for the companies. Thank you. So, tut der? Jawohl. Nach diesen beiden Überblick. Well, these were two overviews, general views, let's say. And we'll talk about the province now. I'm an activist. I used to study computer sciences. I was involved in the open data civil society world. I've worked with the municipality of Ulm for two years. And if people ask me, how can you say what you say? Being a representative of the municipality of Ulm, I tell them I'm speaking here in my capacity as a private person. Now, Ulm. That's about 100,000 inhabitants, most of them in the city, some in the villages around or in the neighborhood. We are, of course, involved in the smart city hype. Of course, when people talk about smartness they show a garage this is the hp garage because people think that if it comes to smartness it needs to be about startups too but what does a smart city mean in the past we thought that this is about a blint a colorful thing flying over your city full of sensors And a blip flies over your city and drops sensors or whatever and then flies on. 
It's a bit like South Park. You have sensors everywhere. Step one is sensors. Step two is DSP. And step three would then be profit. The problem for the customer is, however, that the wheel needs to be reinvented time and again because of the particular funding landscape. You need to reinvent things in order to get money. That's a given. And this means that we cannot work together, which is, and this is the third problem, why we are having island solutions, only isolated solutions. There are different technical worlds which are being represented, but nevertheless, many of the solutions are isolated ones. There are exceptions, but when it comes to the private enterprise world, they want to make money, and that's why they don't share. Now, it's not easy to prove that what I am saying is right. And in particular, it's not easy to prove that we can truly solve real problems of real people. Against this backdrop, the city of Ulm tried to go for a different way. Now, Ulm is smart. Nobody is stupid in the city. Now, a smart person once said, if you go and say we need to make the city be a smart city, we imply that the city used to be a stupid city before, but that's not the case. And for us, the question is first and foremost, how do we convince people to participate and start and reshape their city? These are pictures taken from your traditional PowerPoint presentation. We do have the Verschwörhaus in Ulm, so to speak, the point of departure, a vibrant center used by the local authority and the civil society. Also, the governing mayor of the city is involved. And then we also have a research project, Ulm 2030, that's a spons sponsored on the federal state level, i.e. the land of Baden-Württemberg, is helping us with funding this project. And the question is, how can we enhance the competence of the municipalities so that more can be done in terms of meeting the demand in a smart city? How come, you might wonder, Exposed, actually, it looks as if it had been a plan all right. But actually, the urban transit was the point of departure. In the background, you see the timetable and your typical station, a bus station or a railway station, Now, the question for us about 10 years ago was how can we tell people that their bus will arrive in about 10 minutes so that they have enough time to go out and catch it. We made a number of proposals and the mayor even sponsored a conference so that we could furthermore talk about potential Solutions. We also worked on kindergartens, for example. There was a list of all kindergartens of the city of Ulm. Alphabetical order was used. But if you try to find a kindergarten for your child, it's quite cumbersome to 
phone through an alphabetical list of kindergartens. So we thought it might be much nicer to have a map which shows all kindergartens marked green when there are still places, marked red when they are full. So we truly try to focus on real problems. We also got a lot of um, requests from the civil society, like people who wanted to have a Wi-Fi legally and so on. We also focused on youth media education. That's a, a special program we have run since 2015. The Youth Hacks is the name. Now, all this is to be found in the Verschwörhaus, the uh, city center or the citizens center I mentioned before. And here again, I would like to quote someone smart who, when we tried to get funding, said, well, it's easier to get Google give you money than the city. And yet, we got public funding, and that's not because the city of Ulm is a particularly generous one, but because it makes sense. Thus, we could sponsor programs like the Everything Under 10 GB is Boring project. Now, if you want to sponsor projects like this one, you need to be convinced of the it can be done. And we do it because it can be done spirit or mindset of the people who use the skills, the qualities and the qualification and the know-how of a number of people in order to play and to create. That's uh, the context, so to speak, of our activities. Now, when we talk about the future city, we need to consider four principles, we say at least in Ulm. A fundamental principle is for all. This is not about the elite SUV driver who needs a big parking space for his big car, but it's about reaching out and getting as many people as possible on board. This is certainly one of the challenges of the smart city, which, by the way, also needs to consider all generations and all populations and all groups. We organized a number of workshops, for example, in order to explain what we are interested in. And we tried to go for a different approach because often workshops are being organized and nobody comes because people have to work or are not interested or they don't want to join you. So we decided to reach out to truly go there where people are. And there are some neighborhoods of the city of Ulm where we have what it's called the neighborhood management program. And this is what we benefited from, i.e. we use the access of the social workers who were in certain neighborhoods already. Now, we also focused on a collaborative approach, i.e., we said it's you, it's not the user per se, an anonymous person, it's you. We also focused, and that's the second or third pillar of our approach, on sustainability, and we do have an open source HSL platform. This is a platform developed in Helsinki. And it, it, since it's based on an open source approach, we can, you can simply use it. And that's what we did. So we used the HSL platform for our program. We identified ecological goals. That is to say, we try to convince people to do without their cars whenever possible. And 
We focus on the economic dimension, i.e. Eh? we try to not have the one-time unique experience. We want to have a steady approach. We are working on bike-sharing bike concepts, for example, and others. And, of course, it's important to have many people who collaborate because otherwise you risk your own burnout. And openness. Openness is also an important pillar or the fourth field of interest for us. Open and decentralized systems have always won is a very true statement. The BTX terminal, if you remember, which was once offered by Deutsche Post, did not succeed because it was a proprietary standard and people had to just go for it or not. It was not compatible with any other system. So we rather go for the things network. Public money, public code. That's not difficult to understand for people with an open mindset, how do you convince local authorities to show their pictures, you uh, cooperate with Wikimedia, for example. Because you can upload pictures on Wikimedia, and that's how we did our citizens archive, a photographic archive, because there are lots of people who have lots of photographs at home, and we convince them that it's worthwhile uploading them. The fourth pillar I would like to mention has the buzzword clever. It's bottom up instead of all or nothing, i.e. we work on prototypes and we are convinced of the proof of concept approach. And the second step is then the proof of efficiency or usability or usefulness actually, and only then, after having done the prototype and proven the usefulness, I can go and produce and scale. Here I have a group that looked at the locks for bikes, for bike sharing, bike sharing systems, and they looked at all the locks and they realized that it's only two manufacturers who offer these devices, which was an interesting knowledge. The conclusion, if it's driven by the user, it could work with the city as a whole and control. Thank you. Hello? Yeah, yeah, that's funktioniert. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, this is working. Thank you very much. We've got about 30 minutes for our panel discussion. And, of course, also the audience can participate in this discussion. You know, um, go to the microphone. We have three microphones in this room, and you can also send us your questions through Twitter. Rihanna is going to read this out for us. And we already got a Twitter question by Martin. Martin wanted to know about the relationship between smart cities, quote unquote, and municipalism. Municipalism is a movement which feels that the city is very important for the enforcement of human rights democracy nowadays. 
And um, I would like to share Martin's uh, question because you also mentioned the right to the city in Hamburg. Are there any links? Is there any critique or awareness of what is being uh, thought of smart cities? Thank you for that question. I don't know whether I'm the ideal person to answer the question relating to municipalism. Maybe I can share a few anecdotes from my personal experience when it comes to emancipatory, potentially emancipatory projects. And maybe you can add to this from your own experience as in your own cities. I already mentioned it a minute ago. It's not about a critique of digital infrastructures or technologies, but uh, or to put the question of concerning the utility value and then scalability with regard to urban movement i came across a f quite a few emancipatory empowering projects and i thought it was always interesting to take a look at the digital technologies here primarily it had to do with uh, digital media and infrastructures and uh, to look at the way in which this became pertinent i i'm glad to share a couple of examples which played a role in the context of recht auf stadt i mean vacancy notification so if you just mention if you use data um, in order to to notify any vacancies that residential or commercial uh, buildings uh, that are vacant in a metropolis which sees itself as a growing metropolis and uh, you know that maybe the vacancies existed uh, for speculation reasons so initially the uh, a student by the HCO um, created this vacancy notifier but I mean that app is now being used widely in order to draw attention to the fact that there's, there's lots of unused residential housing or, for instance, participatory mapping. That played an important role in many cities. In Hamburg, we came up with a map of a colonial infrastructure of the city. So we created that map and added information to it. These are projects which can also be found in other cities. Um, Last year, we had the G20 conference in Hamburg, and I thought it was very interesting that the Computer Chaos Club was actively involved, and uh, they tried to set up an alternative media center. These were structures which worked decentrally through free Wi-Fi technology, and they made an important contribution towards uh, developing counter strategies. For instance, uh, the struggle around the Olympic applic Olympia application uh, is something I eagerly followed. I mean, here media played an important role with regard to the massive media presence in Hamburg and uh, to discuss this, uh, so digital media. And these are many examples that evidence that digital technologies can be tremendously helpful. So that is a, an entire bouquet of projects, which of course can also be transferred to other cities, I guess. And maybe we can also implement them. So it creates quite a lot of momentum. I'm wondering, smart cities is also a sustainability issue for many cities, an explicit sustainability issue. So people say we use technologies in order to reduce the consumption of resources, be it in transportation or be it in other areas. Now let me just double check. Is that meaningful when it comes to new sensors? to realize the a lower or more efficient use of resources by buying new technologies. So how does this look in Ulm? That's a good question. At the end of the day, the figures need to tally. Right now, 
Many people make lots of promises what we can save, etc. But the proof of the pudding is in the eating. So people promise everything that you can make more careful use of resources, etc. But very often they don't walk the talk. Very often they don't uh, prove this in terms of facts and figures. I mean, if you optimize the train transport, then you in in extremis you just create more train transport. So actually, you want to avoid this. Well, that's the only thing I can say right now because we don't have that many projects which are brought to our attention. Actually, which should involve a trade-off. Is this a matter of evaluation? Because. Uh, Maybe you start projects as pilot projects, and then uh, people don't really compare the deliverables. Because, I mean, very often we have very uh, lofty deliverables. They say, well, this is, we, this is going to deliver this, that, and the other. But they don't really um, pre uh, point out what they want to achieve. Maybe at the end of the day, you have a glossy power point, like five-fold increase of quality of life. But I don't think these are very robust statements. And very often, I think it's just about ca catering to a new funding strategy. So I've got a blockchain and uh, lots of five times blockchain included in an application. Then uh, you know that's very confusing. As long as we don't, uh, we don't have a clear understanding of what they are trying to achieve. Uh, there is no standard. There is no a reason to be accountable when the people don't know what's even promised or even uh, sold for deliverables. Gibt es? Ich sehe gar keine. Okay, are there any requests for the floor? Unfortunately, I can't see anyone. Does anybody have a question? There's a question from the internet. Matthias is very happy that Stefan Kaufmann is faster than Google and that they actually kind of create a, a bit of a hubbub in the city. But what happens if the big multinational companies are faster? How can we leave it less to coincidence? How can we create an awareness amongst the city management for these joint civic society projects? How can we raise an awareness? Thank you for that question too. I think the point uh, is uh, alternatives uh, or to uh, the capitalistic use of digital technologies. That's what it's aiming at. And I mean, we had a strong discussion in the free software movement in the 1980s. Free software movement means open access. Uh, to software. So codes and source codes should be openly available. And this is linked to the idea that information and technologies, I mean, this is also what you uh, do in your Verschwörhaus, I mean, through tax uh, funds, you are also being paid by tax funds. And that the data and the knowledge uh, is paid for, or is owned by those people who pay for it. So it should be privatized, should be remain in the um, public uh, realm. So it should be owned by the citizen. That's an important perspective. I don't, I don't know where I wanted to go. How can you be faster than Google was the question. My point is the following. I mean, whose interests gain the upper hand? Very often. I mean, those who paid for the knowledge generation. So the, ta the, the knowledge is funded uh, by tax money, and we should make sure that it stays, uh, stays in the hands of citizens. And we should not adopt a broad brush approach with regard to the way city councillors act. So not all uh, city governments get international IT groups into their cities, but they also respond to the public debate. And of course, you need some public pressure from different directions which take place on the streets, but also in the opposition parties. 
in order to create an awareness amongst the city councillors and in order to implement these goals, these deliverables. And there's many cities, especially small and medium-sized cities, who are critical and uh, who know that something is happening in the field of digitalization. They don't want to lose out, but they're not as much uh, under as much press pressure as the metropolises because uh, the biggest multi the multinational companies are interested in big cities. But I think it's interesting to see what's happening in Ulm, North Hesse, uh, Bad Hersfeld. So what happens if uh, mayors and the powers that be decide that we want to adopt a different alternative way of smart city, then actually a lot of things can happen. So there is indeed ways and means in which you can use the pressure of uh, individual software or uh, offset the pressure of individual software to privatize etc i think there was a question over here could i briefly come in can we also get the audi audi mix audio mix uh, on this monitor because um i've got problems in understanding you so it's not that much of a problem to fight google every time people mention google i um, mean many uh, municipal councillors think no hands off we should not forget that city management just basically carries uh, does the executive job so we just implement what the city councillors tell us and we've got a downside that we don't have high glossy brochures which we can submit to the uh, municipal council and this is what it looks like uh, with, with the wonderful smart city charts etc city is going to going to uh, become much ni nicer etc so i think we need to sell a narration maybe also produce wonderful cinematographics and then maybe we can have a usable product at the end of the day. But you sit actually you sit down and I would really welcome it if um people from the Silitech uh, really, uh, you know, grasp the nettle and try to go for a lowly paid job in order to implement a few things. This on the, uh, the idea of how do we fight, for example, a company like Google. I think what we shouldn't forget is Google just doesn't uh, arrive magically here on its own. Uh, insofar as you know, they are building the infrastructure that uh, as a partnership with the city. So we shouldn't forget that the people we vote for are uh, the people who then go on and sign partnership with Google. And so that I think is the is the key point of pressure uh, that we have with smart cities that we may not have actually actually with the, the services we use online uh, is the role of government and the role of the people we elect uh, in, in refusing uh, this kind of partnerships as well. Okay, jetzt aber wirklich. <laughs> Hallo, um, Sören Becker, auch eine okay, Sören Becker, I'm also one of the co-authors of the book. So I've got a, you know, food for thought, a theory, question, observation, I don't know, for the hall. As a, as a, so reclaim the city, that's a slogan for this meeting. On the other hand, we are discussing the smart city. I think that's a contradiction because as a result, uh, we have two different threads inherent. So first of all, we have a smart tech discourse where we try to understand how different applications like open, co open source data can work, function, etc. And then we have a general urban planning discourse where we have discussions such as, do you want to have a Google campus in Berlin, yes or not? So these are different threads and they are often intertwined but this begs the following question, and this is where I'm becoming the devil's advocate. Is a smart city the right location or, um, or the right uh, denomination for a counter movement or is it rather more about uh, the other urban planning discourses thank you very much and please be the agent provocateur the devil's advocate i perfectly agree with you maybe it's a misnomer it's not about uh, creating a better smart city but at the end of the day we need to understand the smart city debate and criticize it. We won't be able to um, uh, 
uh, make Google or Microsoft, uh, I mean, we had Google Toronto example, uh, make them disappear or make them be, uh, make their data become public domain, we can just prevent that they will become more pervasive in the urban development texture and we won't be able to forget our digital everyday knowledge either. And we won't be able to make the smart city concept disappear overnight. So we need to look at what's going on in the outside world. But I perfectly agree with your idea. We do need alternatives. We need to develop alternative narratives. Maybe reclaim the city is an attempt for a counter narrative, but reclaim the city is actually reappropriating something that is almost gone. And it's not about reclaiming something, but uh, coming up with an alternative narrative for smart cities. And this is also what I feel is our remit at Bits and Bäume, that we come up with ideas for with regard to alternative options. Let me make a brief observation. We mentioned Google on various occasions in Berlin. There was a, there were major protests against the campus, and these protests were successful. Google withdrew, and uh, they also abandoned a different uh, building, uh, the old Stasi headquarters, Secret Service of the GDR headquarters. So they won't use that either. But we've also got other companies in common, such as Siemens, who now now intended, uh, who who now signed a memorandum uh, of understanding, so that they will get uh, Industry 4.0 neighborhood for 600 million euros. And this is also where Google is embedded. So that was just by way of information. Okay. Any further questions? If that is not the case, I can continue the round of questions. I can put a very specific or tan tangible question. If I work for a city, what do I do when I'm presented with one of these glossy brochures? If I have a certain proposition, how do I handle it best? Whom do I contact? Whom can I ask? Zuständig ist, weil sonst darf man nee. Also um, Grundsätzlich ist so. Well, normally, if you work for a local authority, you would not roll out such a project alone. It's normally the city council that initiates such a project. Now, ultimately, this is about making a proposal. The administration makes a proposal how to implement it. And if you have groups like the Chaos Computer Club or similar initiatives in your city, you should get in touch. Most cities are part of the Association of Cities in Germany or other similar alliances. And there is an opportunity to exchange ideas. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. I agree. Networking is what it's all about. The cities are members of different institutional networks. But the cities that don't want to collaborate with IT projects also need to become part of the networks. We know that individual cities have tried to overcome the traditional approach. Munich, for example, has given up its uh, proprietary sof software, but they failed. Not because the current government wanted to get Microsoft on board again, but because they were not part of a network and other cities in Germany were just waiting to see what would happen to Munich. But this is not the way it works. It only works if there are many sides, many parties to work on the software to further develop the programs. So you need financial resources and a willingness to work on 
software solutions together, which implies sharing your knowledge about codes and data functionality. Now, Munich was your typical it's all or nothing approach. It's like when they introduce SAP, SAP not as a supportive tool, but as a means to transform the company as a whole. Now, this is certainly also about bringing the two debates about the smart city and urban development together. Munich certainly has a certain power of negotiation because they do have HQs of huge corporations. Experiences, the experience of public space, uh, also on a personal, individual, but maybe also collective level. Um, how can how can we try and uh, you're talking about privacy, global movement, and, and activism? Um, how can we uh, shape a, a movement for the protection of public space in this sense? Uh, on, a, on a city level too, and uh, is there a way maybe for cities to work together in this regard? Um, well, it's a little difficult, to be honest, for me to, to answer, um, uh, really, because obviously the, it depends on the, the geographical uh, uh, context. But already, I mean, in Europe, we're starting to see some interesting initiative, for example, in, uh, in Barcelona. And I think um, around the issue of, uh, of data commons, for example, and pu putting the data, uh, the data gathered from the city in commons. So I think definitely with the European Union, I think that there is uh, there's also an opportunity for uh, models to be easily reprodu reproduced because in in terms of sites in terms of uh, issues I think a lot of, uh, of cities have uh, a lot to share and a lot in common I um, I think and you know maybe sadly but a lot of it seems to depend largely still on, uh, on local governments, because at the end of the day, they, they are the ones who have the, the final say on a lot of the on a lot of the the infrastructure and a lot of you know defining what uh, becomes our cities. Uh, and actually, so what, what was interesting, for example, with Barcelona is the um, uh, the current uh, the current uh, group that's in power emerged from. Um, uh, Los Indignados, the, the protest movement that was happening uh, that was happening in Spain a couple of uh, uh, years ago. So I think uh, this definitely it, it definitely shows that actually protest movement can evolve into uh, into elected uh, elected groups. That that was uh, for that reason an inspiring uh, an inspiring uh, uh, movement. Uh, but I think one of the one of the um, ideas and especially as we were discussing reclaiming the cities, what we want our cities to look like, um, there is definitely a discourse to be had about uh, how do we how do we build a smart cities that's not just about the data collection that's not just about the, the even just not uh, even be going beyond technologies uh, what does a good city look like and I think that's uh, definitely something we can try and uh, and look at other models within within the cities we live in for sure. yeah ich glaube wir haben wieder eine Frage um, ja sie haben am Anfang am Beispiel von Hamburg über die When we talked about Hamburg, we also talked about more and more private transport, more and more cars in the city and how to park them in the smartest possible way. Now, parking cars require a lot of space. And the German example is certainly an excellent illustration because the uh, automotive lobby in Germany is very powerful. Now the question is how should cities like Hamburg and others deal with this problem? Well, I mentioned Hamburg because I know Hamburg best. It's a negative example, but uh, 
the reason I mention it is it's the city I know best. There are also other ways of controlling traffic and transport in the city, like the city of Oslo. They are reducing the parking space in the city each year by 10 percent, for example, in order to make urban spaces available to private users. In other cities, it's different. They're, they don't try to reduce parking spaces. They even try to build more parking spaces or make more parking offers. And this is being done by private companies, of course, because the uh, local authorities promise to private builders of garages or parking spaces that they can make money by offering parking spaces, which is a process which is being enhanced also by reducing public transport. If there are no trains that get you to the city, I need to use my car. That's what people think. However, it's also possible or feasible to remove all private transport and traffic from the inner city. However, I've never heard this approach in the context of the smart city discourse because there is no money to be made by removing private transport from the city center. We know that all big Car builders in Germany are offering cars for car sharing purposes, BMW, Volkswagen and Mercedes. And Volkswagen even wants to benefit from these car sharing services in order to get more cars downtown. Or BMW goes and says, why don't you do car sharing? This is a way for you to test our newest BMW car. No, the idea behind is to sell more cars, even more cars, and to get more cars into inner city areas. So this is not about inviting people to sell their cars and hire a car whenever they need one. And this is not the effect that is being triggered either, as studies show. It's, it's rather about, well, once in a while testing another type of car than the one you usually use. Now we could go and say let's reduce MIF privatized, private motorized transport by 30 percent. I'd be happy to see evidence-based policy, i.e. policy based on measurements. I'd be happy to, to get the adequate figures that show the modal split in my city because that would certainly help me convince the city council and the municipality of a different approach. Right now, in election campaigns, there are some political parties that go and say they want to have a car-free city. But this is not what smart city is about alone. We need to have an overall idea in order to move into the right direction. Now, if there is one more question, we can admit one more question. Now, I'd like to offer a provocative question or thesis. Now, examples like the Verschwörhaus or similar centers are anecdotal, so to speak. And of course, there are sensors to measure air pollution or the quality of the air. But uh, it's uh, different players who run the game, so to speak. Now, in spite of my love for decentralized solutions, I think we need solutions on the level of the respective federal state. Am I right? Because, as you said, it doesn't make sense for each and every city to develop its own system. 
So we probably need city apps or app sets, which are comfy solutions for the user and thus competitive. I think the question was for me, and my answer is yes and no, maybe. In the long run, we will have to go this way. But your typical procedure in such a situation is you establish a steering committee and then you agree on a goal, on a target, and then you produce lots of paper, tons of paper, for five or six years. The problem is, however, how to implement the solution you eventually find, the anecdotes, and you are right. We are telling anecdotes are meant to inspire others or trigger proje projects in other places so that the overall idea can grow. It's about starting and then there is a phase of consolidation which we haven't reached yet. And eventually you will have a number of cities working on joint projects in a decentralized approach and of course you need a coordinating agency and of course you need to pool resources in order to furthermore fund these projects that's probably the way to go but it does not make sense to open the big umbrella and to have the one big authority who does it all the federal government if i may add this piece of information will launch a funding program next year and this is certainly going to be an address for you if you want to have open standards or an open software enshrined in the overall approach and this could also be a way to establish collaborations in order to go beyond the island solution right I don't think we have to think about how to improve the mark smart city or how to replace the given technology by open source systems. We rather need to make people understand what the problems are we need to work on, like housing, affordable housing, more and better mobility, less dead people in the streets and less damaging for your health. I mean, these are the most urgent problems in the context of traffic and transportation in our cities. And there are certain tools we can use in order to better the situation. But the smart city offers right now are not a way to really help us solve all these problems. They don't get us new social housing, for example, i.e. There are certain problems which are eminent in the cities and what is being offered in the context of the smart city is not helpful. And that needs, that needs to be the point of departure for our debate. Right, I think our time is up. Now, this was a kind of an abrupt ending, but uh, we'll certainly have an opportunity to furthermore talk about all these questions during the conference. Thank you once again for having joined me here on the podium, and I'm looking forward to further conversations.